very special guest, so happy to see you. Introduce yourself to my, people in Colorado. <laughs> my name is Marilyn Vandiver Atler, and anybody over the age of 70 <laughs> no. knows that name. <laughs> because of what ties? Went to Miss New America. Ever? Miss America. Miss Colorado. Miss University of Colorado so long ago. But that, that's such a proud moment for many people in our state. We've only had three. I know. Um, and uh, that's how many people recognized you and knew you until? Until I became, uh, I thought Miss America would be what I would always be, but the Denver Post um, put on the front page that I'm an incest survivor. And that was, I thought, the worst day of my life. It turned out to be an entirely new beginning of the most incredible life. I thought my daughter wouldn't be accepted into law school, no family would want their son to marry her, nobody would look at me the same way again, and nobody did look at me the same way again. But people stopped me. We had 3,000 people come forward in three months. We founded an entire huge building called Sun, and we saw up to 500 people a week for free. It was just an amazing time, and I'm still traveling. I'm still speaking about it. So that was how many years ago? 28. 28 years ago. When you think about it, you had accomplished so much, and, and we really don't even have enough time, but people knew you as a TV spokesperson, motivational speaker, and then they see this other thing that everybody looks at this perfect life, right. and they say, oh my gosh, yeah. it wasn't perfect. From age five to age 18, 13 years. It was a long, it was a difficult journey. And those memories were kind of repressed in your mind. They were repressed, uh, which is very difficult for people to understand. Um, my youth minister, who had known me for nine years, kept watching me, and he would just tuck little pieces of a puzzle into the back of his mind. And when I married someone other than the man I have loved since I was 15 years old and have been married to for 53 years, when I married someone other than Larry, he said, okay, now I understand. She's trying to destroy herself. I just have to understand why. And the next time we met, after nine years, he asked me the question. I don't remember it. Did your father come into your bedroom at night, however he wanted to say it? And I didn't say anything. I just sobbed. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. All the, all the memories came up. My eldest sister, Gwen, has all of her memories, but mine were repressed until age 24. So I was choosing um, an abusive marriage because that's what I felt I, I deserved. I didn't deserve Larry, Larry Atler. So when you talk to people, how do you explain to them how they resolve that? Because then you're telling family members about the secret and you're confronting it and confronting your own mother. Well, first I confronted my father and I was 40. I had been hospitalized. My trigger was my daughter's age. So when Jennifer turned five, the age I was when it began, her age it all began shutting me down. So I was hospitalized with paralysis. And we didn't know, I didn't know what was causing it, but I did in the hospital say, there's something that I need to do. I need to talk to my father. And so I went into therapy for the first time and told my psychiatrist, and he said, you can't do that for two years. You can't talk to your father for two years. I, I walked out of there and called my father. And I said, I, I need to speak to you. And I drove home as fast as I could because I, I was terrified of doing this. And when he knew why, all I said was, this is the most difficult thing I've ever done. And he said, I'll be back in a minute. And he went up the long winding staircase. When he came back, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind he had a gun. Knew he had a gun. Knew he could use it. But I also knew I was gonna die a day at a time. And so I confronted him. Um, my anger had not come up yet. Um, he said, if I had known what it would do to you I never would have done it. I was 40. When I was 56, I received a letter from a woman in Denver who told me my father had sexually violated her about 20 times when he was 74. He died of a heart attack at age 75. He never stopped until he died. They never stop. That's part of the message that you share to, to audiences is. across the country. They that don't is. stop. And when I then needed to tell my mother a year after my father had died, I waited for my father to die. And she said, I don't believe you, it's in your fantasy. And one day I was sobbing and she said, I have no tears for you. I can feel nothing for you, what do you do with that? Where do you go with that? 
when most of us are in our 40s, um, when we go through the healing process, hard to understand, but it's true. Um, late 30s to early 40s, that was true for me. So I turned to my mother in my 40s. I needed her and to her death at age 88. She made a choice and she did not choose me. It was very painful. And I know we're talking about different things when you're talking about incest, but right now we see in our country a change just with this Me Too movement where all of a sudden people are feeling like it's okay to say something happened to me. You've been trying to tell people that for years. I have been, and when I was living in New York, Me Too, I mean the vice president of AT&T, the president of CBS, it's just like every place I went, Me Too, Me Too. I don't want to say but, but far more traumatizing as a child. Yes. As an adult, I lost my job. I lost my jobs. Uh, was it traumatic? Yes. Did I stand up for myself? Yes. Lost my job. Very different from children. And the reason I was so excited when you asked me to come to talk to you today is because after my story broke, book, publish, bu book publishers and mo movie producers called in. I didn't want to do that. I began speaking. I spoke in over 500 cities. People line up for an hour or two to tell me their stories. People stop me on the street and tell me their stories. I kept hearing one sentence over, I thought if I hear this sentence one more time, when I was seven and my brother was 14, when I was eight and my brother was 13, when I went to group support, half violated my brothers. I thought, well, my pain is more than theirs. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. We need to talk to our children. We need to sit down and talk to our teenagers. It's inappropriate touching. They don't know. This is the st st statistic. 14-year-olds comprise the largest number of sex offenders of any age group. 14-year-olds. 14-year-olds. And we these are because they're at that age sure. where you're experimenting Absolutely. or wondering and Absolutely. you have a sister or a and sibling? You and the younger sibling, when it starts, is usually five. It happens in the nicest families. So after a banquet one night, one man said, okay, uh, I'll talk to my children, but I don't know how to start. I said, well, how about starting with the truth? Last night I went to a banquet and this woman said, I need to sit down and talk to you kids. And this is hard for me. I hope it'll be easier for you when you're with your children, but here we go. I said, can you do that? He said, I can do that. So your message today is have that conversation. Have that, and it isn't just one Tell conversation. Tell them multiple times, make this simple. Inappropriate touching is never appropriate. There are long-term effects for the younger child. It can never happen with a younger or less powerful child. And occasionally girls are one of our best known Miss Americas, Vanessa Williams was sexually molested, uh, I think she was 12, by an older teenager girl and it only happened once and it impacted her life mm -hmm. very strongly. So we need to talk to our girls as well. Don't have teenagers babysit for younger children. Please don't do that. If, if you were in my shoes for one week, you wouldn't do that. We need to talk to our children. We need to protect them. We need to be aware of it. It's happening all the time in many, many, many families. Uh, one out of six boys, the men, oh, the men. The man who stopped me. If you had one, up, and I know you have so many uplifting, positive things that have happened in your life, and good things, and this is empowering. Your message to someone that's suffering, is it that there is the other side, or how do you get there? What's your message to them? Email me. <laughs> email you? Yeah. Call. you. I know you get these emails this and is, calls I, all the time. This is what I do, four to five hours every single day. I just email me, I'm there, you need to talk about it. And if your shame is too big to disclose to someone, I'm pretty anonymous, I'm very confidential, you need to start talking about it. Pick someone that you trust and talk to them about it. It's the secret and the shame. When my story was on the cover of People Magazine, it said, Miss America overcomes shame. That's what it's about is shame. It wasn't rape or incest. It's the secret and the shame. We need to start talking about it. Just like this Me Too yeah. with these women who are starting, and men. 
Absolutely. Are starting to talk so about. I, I kind of look at your life in, in, in two giant chapters. Yep. And you had accomplished so much in the crown and all the glory. But boy, nothing, nothing. That like. was not a good place to be in. You're oh, much happier. I am. I am 80 and just filled with meaning and joy. Yeah, I got to the other side. Okay. And they can email you, you have a website, and you have a book. I do. Miss, You've Am got Miss America by Day. All right. It's always important and important to talk about Thank you. family discussions. Family discussions. Yeah. I'm Silk Yogajir here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me.